those viewers who have seen my earlier video on the Gigatron computer, which is a small computer based on TTL logic and which does not use a microprocessor, those viewers will remember that the computer comes bundled with two or three small applications which demonstrate that it is an operating computer, but there's not really that much more that can be done with it. It's a really cool demonstrator, but the applications are very limited. The only I.O. available on the Gigatron is, uh, besides the video output, is a set of four LEDs, which are called the blinking lights, and also a uh, game controller connector, which connects up to a classic style game controller for playing the embedded games. Now in uh, the fall of 2018, the creators of the Gigatron have come out with an adapter which they call Pluggy McPlugface, a cute name. And it basically provides a way to connect a PS2 style keyboard to the Gigatron, thereby having the ability to type in uh, text and that allows then the Gigatron to do things like be a TV typewriter or run a small monitor for manipulation of the memory. And the kit, or the Pluggy Mick Plug Face kit, which sells for about 10 euro, so very inexpensive, is the subject of this video. The Pluggy Mick Plug Face kit consists of only four components the small circuit board, the PS2 keyboard connector, a 9-pin D connector which interfaces with the Gigatron's game port, and finally the heart of it which is, in spite of its small size, this is actually a microcontroller chip. This is an AT Tiny 85 microcontroller, and it handles all the interface between the Gigatron and the PS2 keyboard. It also includes some non-volatile memory which can be used by the Gigatron to store a user program and then retrieve it. So in one small inexpensive interface the Gigatron can now be used for something more productive than just playing a few games with a game controller and it also allows the storage and retrieval of user written programs. The microcontroller also has some EEPROM in it not only for its own use but for the user applications and it comes with for example a version of Tiny Basic embedded in it which can be loaded using the Gigatron's loader application which was already covered in my earlier video. So that's another perk of this kit. Not part of the Pluggy McPlugface kit, but available is version 3 of the Gigatron ROM. This also includes Tiny Basic, and it also includes a ported version of the Wasmon or a uh, small machine language monitor written by Steve Wozniak for the Apple I. This is a very simple uh, application which uses less than 256 bytes of memory and it allows examination of memory location and changing of memory locations and running an application at a particular address. So um, this EEPROM provides basic so you don't have to load it from the Pluggy McPlug face. It has the Wasmon and it has some additional applications uh, besides those that were in the version 1 uh, EEPROM for the Gigatron. But this does have to be bought separately from the uh, Pluggy McPlug face. The manual for the Pluggy McPlug face is not provided as a hard copy with the kit, but it is downloadable from the Gigatron website. As usual with my projects, when manuals come 
in a soft form like that, I print them out before starting to build or work with the, uh, the kit or other product. I just prefer hard copy manuals. So just a quick overview of the manual here. And I should say that the Gigatron itself does come with a hard copy manual, but it's only really the assembly manual and schematics. The operation manual for the Gigatron is something you have to download. And in this case, I think at the low uh, price point of this Pluggy McPlugface kit, uh, they decided not to include the printed manual. So it's got uh, an introduction, it's got the assembly instruction identification of parts, uh, there's only a few steps because there's only a few components. Then it talks about uh, how to use the uh, PS2 adapter plugged into the Gigatron. It's programmed in such a way that the keyboard can be used to provide the game controller outputs. And this is important because there's only the one port and some of the apps on the Gigatron remain as games. So you need a game controller to use those applications. If you've got the keyboard plugged in through this adapter, then the game controller can't be plugged in. So all of the buttons on the game controller have been mapped to keys on the keyboard. So just plugging in the PS2 keyboard still allows you to play the regular games as well as do typing. So this identifies the key equivalency. Then it talks about the Tiny Basic, which is already loaded into the keyboard controller's microcontroller, or I should say keyboard adapter's microcontroller. It lists all the instructions that are available. It's not really a tutorial on Basic, but it does give you enough to get going if you have some familiarity with other versions of Basic. And it talks about uh, using some poke commands in the Tiny Basic to manipulate the Gigatron. For example, changing the color of text uh, present on the video monitor and controlling the blinking lights. Then there's uh, references to downloadable manuals and other information. Then I have added quite a few pages here which are just screen captures from the Gigatron website talking about the graphics commands available in the Tiny Basic. A further exploration of peek and poke commands and how you might use those. talks about where the video memory starts, so that's useful information. There's a video indirection table and it talks about that. Some examples are given. And it talks further about the manipulation of the blinking lights using basic poke commands. And it gives some examples of that. The Gigatron also has that single channel audio output and poke commands can be used to manipulate that output for producing sound effects. Some sample code is given. And the uh, Tiny Basic includes the ability to work with arrays so they're one-dimensional arrays, but still it's an array, and it talks about how to utilize those. It talks about saving a program to the keyboard adapter and how to retrieve it. And it talks about some other advanced features. And then it gives a little overview of the history of Microsoft Basic and Tiny Basic. And then it covers some quirks of the Tiny Basic. In addition, I have here a couple of pages of emails between myself and the creators of the Gigatron, which I just printed out and made part of my printed manual. So, with that aside, 
I was hard pressed to find a schematic of the Pluggy McPlug face. None was provided with the kit or listed on the website, so I decided to trace it out myself. I'm going to talk about that here briefly. So once again, the adapter consists of this much circuitry. Um, really, the microcontroller and the two connectors, that's it. There's no resistors, capacitors, diodes, anything else. Um, <clears throat> I've organized this schematic with the controller connector here. This plugs into the serial controller jack on the Gigatron. And I've shown what kind of circuitry is in the Gigatron servicing that jack. Then there's the AT Tiny 85 microcontroller and the PS2 keyboard connector. And then a break out of uh, the pin functions on a typical PS2 uh, socket. So let's start out here. There obviously has to be some way to get data from the PS2 keyboard into the Gigatron. But that would be a one-way communication. There's also need to send data from the Gigatron to the keyboard adapter for the purpose of storing programs in the internal non-volatile RAM. So what do we need? We need, need at least one signal going each direction, and there is. There is a serial data input on the Gigatron, which is pulled up to VCC through a resistor. That's the available input channel. And that's the same one that's used for the game controller, which basically has a chip in it that converts the push buttons on the game controller to a serial stream. That chip is controlled by a couple of digital outputs from the Gigatron, to the game controller, and those are also utilized here. They're buffered with a small value resistor, 68 ohms in both cases, and it's using bit 6 and bit 7 of the internal 8-bit output port, which is used for um, the game controller, it's used for audio, it's used to control the VGA output. It's really the only output there is in the whole Gigatron, just those 8 bits, and they can be used in different ways. The two signals coming out go out through pins 3 and 4, and they end up on the first two bits of the microcontroller. The microcontroller only has eight pins, and one's used for VCC, one's used for reset, and it's tied high, and one is ground. That leaves five pins, and they're numbered D0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. These pins can be digital inputs or digital outputs, and... Two of them, I believe it's two, can be used as analog signals as well. But in this case, they're all being used as digital I.O. So those two outputs from the Gigatron, out, out 6 and out 7, come in through the game controller port and go into D0 and D1 on the microcontroller. Then the microcontroller formats the data coming from the PS2 keyboard and sends it serially back through pin 2 into the serial data input of the Gigatron, which just goes into a shift register chip on the Gigatron, which is a shift register, as I said, that converts the serial stream back into 8 bits of data, which is then read through the internal 8-bit input port. So with those three pins used for communication with the Gigatron, there's two more pins here used for the PS2 keyboard. Now, I was studying up on this because I'd never really looked into PS2 before, but my understanding is that the uh, an IC or ICs in a typical PS2 keyboard take a look at whichever key is being pushed and then send out a, some form of an ASCII equivalency as serial data. And that just goes straight out through one pin from pin 1 of the PS2 connector into the D3 input of the microcontroller. In addition, there is a clock signal which is required, and that comes out of the PS2 connector on pin 5 and goes into the D4 input of the microcontroller. Now, my understanding is that this clock signal, while nominally an output from the keyboard to the host device, which is this microcontroller in this instance, it can also be used 
to reset or clear or do something with the PS2 keyboard if this device drags this signal low then this device plugged in here can sense that and do something with that information so I'm presuming that at some time this nominal input is also used as an output to reset clear or whatever the keyboard plugged in here but nominally it's a signal going this direction <clears throat> And this is just a view of the um, PS2 socket as viewed looking right into the socket. Well, it's the other way around. Like that. This diagram identifies the pins. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It identifies the keying. And it identifies that pin 1 is the data output. Pin 3 is the ground. Pin 5 is the clock signal. Uh, pin 2 is not connected to anything pin 4 is VCC and pin 6 is not connected. So that's just an overview of the pluggy McPlug face circuit. I presume I got it all right. I forgot to mention that the Gigatron also provides power for this, not only for the adapter but for the keyboard. So VCC from the Gigatron and its ground of course come in on pins 6 and uh, 8 respectively, and uh, so that's the V plus or VCC and the ground. The chip uses the VCC and the ground, and the VCC and the ground are also applied to the PS2 connector, which in turn power the keyboard connected to the PS2 plug. So this is a close-up of the circuit board. I've just uh, used a Sharpie pen to mark the pins of the um, game controller I use that when I was ringing out the signal or the uh, foils. It just identifies what the board is here, and then here's the flip side, which shows where the tiny AT or AT tiny 85 controller goes, and J1, which is the PS2 keyboard, and it even has a short set of instructions for how to load a program from the controller into the Gigatron you start the unloader or the loader app on the Gigatron and then you push control F1 for help and control F1, F2, etc. to load different things. So it's it's sort of a short form reminder. You, you still have to read the manual. I just went ahead and soldered in the microcontroller with the chip in the socket since that's the way it came with the kit. Didn't seem to be any good reason to unplug it from the socket, solder the socket, and plug it back in. And next the PS2 connector is soldered on. These things are a royal pain. This is only the second one I've ever had to solder onto anything. The first one being on my Apple One clone. And uh, it's really hard to get the pins to all line up. It takes quite a bit of fiddling around unless you get really lucky. Okay, so here's the nearly completed board with the um, game controller connector soldered on the back side of the board and the instructions are at pains to point out that's the way you have to do it I'm not sure I guess it would probably fit on the board the other way but it would uh, not work that way and uh, the other thing I'm going to do is cut off the excess pin length since I'll be pushing this on to the Gigatron with my fingers and those pins will be in the way and will probably hurt. And here is the Pluggy McPlug face plugged into the back of the Gigatron. The circuit board hangs down below the case but not below the rubber feet that are provided with the Gigatron so it should actually sit just above the tabletop. The PS2 connector comes out the side and there's another view of it uh, plugged in. Okay, let's see what happens when I plug the power into the Gigatron. I get my usual front screen there. And uh, the up and down navigation that is usually used to select um, the application should be the up and down keys, the way it's mapped. Well, not quite. Let's see.
Well, my uh, replacement PS2 connectors came in. I had to buy a pack of four to get the one. And so I just have to do a desoldering job now to get the old connector out. An inspection with my jeweler's loop revealed that the contacts on this look much better than the ones on here. So hopefully that will make all the difference. Okay, I've made the requisite repair. I've got the new PS2 socket installed on the board. I've got my vintage PS2 keyboard plugged in and the adapters plugged into the uh, game con uh, game connector or game port whatever you want to call it on the Gigatron video monitors hooked up sounds hooked up USB power source is ready to plug in my monitor is powered up and my keyboards ready to go so let's see what happens got the blinking lights and I get the let's see if I can find an angle without all this garbage Okay, so um, the keyboard gets remapped, or the left, right, up, and down cursors do the same thing as they did on the game controller. That would be here. The uh, select key from the game controller now becomes page down. The uh, start button on the game controller, which is usually used as a soft reset, is the page up. So. Um, select video mode and soft reset and any of these keys here the end or delete key or the backspace all are mapped to the A key which is what on the game controller would start an application or if you were on the uh, the racer program would be the accelerator pedal and the B key which on the uh, racer is the brake pedal that's the home or the insert key so everything's just right up about here so let's see if I can navigate that's working great so let's see if I can play snake well first I'm gonna alternate the video mode so that'll be uh, the page down key yep and then back to the normal mode and of course it'll run much faster in the normal mode since it's spending less time updating the video and uh, I'm gonna navigate to snake it's already there I'm going to push the um, the um, end key to play the game Well, at least the uh, keys were working. Let me uh, do a soft reset, which is page up for two seconds. And I'm going to try the racer. And once again, the uh, end key should select it. So I'm in the racer. And the accelerator is going to be... Uh, end and the home key is going to be break so I put on the brakes oops I crashed. Game over. But it's working! The uh, keyboard adapter is basically functional. Okay, I'm going to do a soft reset. Um, what did I say that was? Page up for two seconds. Okay, now I want to get into the loader because remember that the uh, Tiny Basic program is located on uh, EEPROM inside of 
this tiny microcontroller chip on the keyboard adapter. So um, I'm going to navigate down to the loader and activate it by pressing the end key. Now it's trying to load something and it's set up if I push F2 that should start loading something. I don't know if it did. Doesn't exactly say anything. Oh, hold control and push F2. All right. Now it's doing something. And there I am, tiny basic V2. Okay. Let's try the classic program. And it probably needs end because it's such a small program. So I'm going to put that in. I'm going to try listing. And I'm going to run it. Tiny Basic is working. Okay, the um, Pluggy McPlug Face keyboard adapter has the ability to save and load programs that the user writes uh, machine code or basic or certainly basic and I think machine code as well using of course the Gigatron's own machine language but I'm gonna just try with basic here um, it doesn't allow file names because it only will save one file it always assumes there's a single file so I'm gonna try saving just try type save and it should do it it only will do about 20 to 30 lines of code. Save value error. Okay. Okay, so I did a little more research on the reason why I couldn't load and save from Tiny Basic. And that's because I'm loading the somewhat stripped down version that's included on the available leftover memory on the microcontroller on the uh, keyboard adapter and not the full tiny basic which is available on EEPROM for the Gigatron proper so it certainly doesn't have the load and save commands and that's why it didn't work um, but otherwise the keyboard adapter is working great and I think it's time to plug in the uh, version 3 EEPROM. I've got the version 1 in there now. We're going to upgrade that. So the version 3 ROM is installed on the Gigatron and we're ready to power it up. See if it works. Blinking lights are blinking and I get the new ROM version 3 screen which has the same Snake Racer, Mandelbrot, Pictures, Credits, and Loader as on the original V1, but it also has Tetranus, Bricks, Tic-Tac-Toe, Basic, and the uh, Gigatron version of the Wasmon. So, let's try out the Basic first. Well, actually, I'm going to check out the Snake first, so... So let's try that again. So now I've got Snake Racer... And this is the screen mode, and let's see, is it home? There we go. Okay, so that's working. And um, I think it's the... I'm already forgetting what the mapped keys are. There, that's 
that's right, page up is the reset. So let's go over to basic and um, and we're into tiny basic right now. That was easier than doing it from the loader. So I'm going to plug in my caps lock and do 10. Oops, let's see. No, it doesn't care. <laughs> All right, so four, at least it allows backspacing. That's good. For i equals one to 10, 20, print i, 30, next i, 40, end. Okay, that's in there. So the program runs. And I'm going to do a save now and see if it saves. And it does goofy stuff with the screen because it has to interlace the screen operations with the serial signal being sent out to the keyboard adapter using the same data line. So it's trying to display data while it's sneaking in special uh, pulses to the uh, microcontroller on the keyboard adapter. That's the sneaky method they're using to get some I.O. where it wasn't originally designed. Uh, so now I'm going to type in new. I'm going to do a list. Verify I don't have a program there. And now, what is the trick? Okay, I've uh, typed in a little program from the manual, and I've saved it, and then cleared memory. So I'm going to do my Control F3 here. Load the program in. This is a little graphics program. Let's see what it does. So like a horizontal bouncing bowel program, it just bounces back and forth it looks like. Control C is the break. There we go. That worked. There is a line command which draws a line starting from the current writing position, x pixels to the right and y pixels down. The values may be negative and lines can wrap around the edges of the screen when needed. So I'm going to do a clear screen and I'm going to do a line 100 comma 60 and it drew that line from that position to that position. Here's another little program from the manual. This is using some peaks and pokes here into Gigatron memory and doing a little bit of math. Let's see what it does. Oh, syntax error in line 20. What did I do wrong? X equals 4 plus 8 times I. Oh, I left out a colon. I've got to fix that. Okay, with the correct syntax, now I'm going to run it. And I'll break out of there. So there's also poke commands that can be used to change the way the blink and lights on the Gigatron work. 
For example, if I just type in the direct basic command, poke 47 comma 5, that'll put a 5 in location 47. Let's see what happens. They sped up a little bit. And if I poke, oops, I didn't get the letter P in there. Poke 47 comma 120. It looks like it slowed it way down. Go and poke 47 comma 9. And it restored them to normal operation. So there's things like that that can be done. There are poke commands for the sound effects. A poke at location. Hmm. This is an old keyboard, not all the keys work reliably. 44, comma 60 should play the Gigatron startup chime for one second. So address 44 is the sound countdown timer. Normally it reads zero and that means that all sound is off. If it's a positive number, all four software generated sound channels will be forwarded to the extended output port. A timer counts down 60 times per second, so a value of 60 gives it one second. So if I poke 44 comma 120, one plays it for two seconds, sort of like that. And each sound channel is independent, so a little program can be written to play music. Here's a little program that starts with a variable C from the value of 2 to 4 and does a little math based on the value of C at the moment and sets a value of P according to that. Then it pokes P with a value of 0 and pokes the next value above P with a 0 and then uh, does the next C and keeps doing that. So that I think will probably switch off all the channels. So let's do that. And now poke 44 comma 60. Oops. So we've turned off 2, 3, and 4, but we have not turned off channel 1. Uh, therefore, only channel 1 sounded when we instructed it to play its Gigatron chime, so we only have part of the chord. So uh, here's a fairly lengthy program I typed in from the manual. It's got more than will fit on the screen. And uh, let's see if I typed it incorrectly. So it puts kind of a little piano keyboard up there mapped to the letters of the keyboard. So they're like the black keys and the white keys. There's a problem with U. Line 117 has an issue. Let's fix that. Okay, I was up around Y, wasn't I? Y, 7. There, now it's all working. So let's see. I don't think it plays two notes at a time, though. Nope, it doesn't do chords. So let's see. Oop, there's a error in line 11. No, it wasn't really an error in the program, it was just that it does a go sub to a bunch of lookup tables based on the key that's hit, but if I push a key that is invalid, then it 
calculates a jump to subroutine to a line that doesn't exist in the program and that was the issue there. The uh, basic in here, even though it's a tiny basic, is pretty good. It doesn't have more advanced uh, string commands and so on, but it has some basic graphic, basic sound, uh, ability to do actual stuff. Um, so it's, it's not a total toy. And it's pretty impressive that it's able to run on this Gigatron that doesn't even have a microprocessor. Looking at the jumpy screen again here, which occurs when saving the program. It's a little hard to see it on the video, but it's very apparent when you're actually looking at the screen. Here's all those um, data instructions that are implemented by selective go subs to these lines at the end of the program. And that's why there are uh, line numbers with jumps in them because the calculation uh, calculates a number that has to correspond to a line number. So I'm going to navigate over to the Wasmon here. Oops, that's right, it's, um, it's not that. There we go, we're in the Wasmon here. It doesn't do the normal prompt that one would expect from the Wasmon. It just gives that character. So the program says Wasmon, and it's just like being in the Apple II Wasmon, except for the punctuation. To read memory, enter one or more hexadecimal addresses and press Enter. For example, I could look at address um, 002A and it'll return the value of 20 that's at that location. If I want to put in 0000.00FF it'll return all that data at all those locations. Writing data can be done by adding value to an address, the command 2a twenty two will write a value of twenty two into memory location zero zero two a which will turn the background purple apparently. I didn't exact oh it did. It's kinda down there. There we go. Only as I refresh and add stuff to the display does the background turn purple, so that worked. The command um, 2F and put 04 and it'll be just like the poke command. Oops. So I was hitting the wrong key as I was trying to type with one hand. So I'm going to put a value of 4 into 2F which will affect the blinking lights, making them run faster. There we go. Just like when we did it in BASIC. And we can start programs. Let's see, Wasmon program itself is at location 200. So if I type in the address 200 and just put an R after it, that'll restart the Wasmon. There we go. It mattered whether it was upper or lower case. As I found here, it's uh, case sensitive. So the Wasmon works. Let's try the pictures again, see if they added anything else to the EEPROM. Ah, let's see, end. So we've still got the bird. And the planet. I guess it just has a timer. I have to be patient. I think it's a little longer time than it was originally. Maybe it's my imagination. And we've got the bird again, so 
seems like it's only doing a couple of pictures. I don't see the baboon on here. Maybe they took that out to save memory. Several different quality modes there. Reboot. Let's uh, do tic-tac-toe real quick here. Tic-tac-toe. Tom Pittman's tic-tac-toe. You play against Tiny Basic. You are X. I am O. You play your turn by typing the number of a square. I was never good at tic-tac-toe. Let's see what happens if I put in a 4. And I don't know what it's doing. Oh, it's thinking, I guess. It's got the little thinking bar going on. I play five, so he goes in there, and I say, well, I'm going to put in a six. It's very slow thinking here. And so I have to try to block it with a one. So I gotta try to block a three. I gotta try oops, he wins. I like I said I'm terrible at tic tac toe, but I kinda feel <laughs> this very minimal computer here beating me at tic tac toe. I feel like I'm uh Dave Poole in 2001 A Space Odyssey or no, is it Dave Poole? No, it's um... I don't remember what the astronaut's name is Astronaut Poole anyway uh, who is famously shown playing chess against the HAL 9000 and being beat at least in that case it was by a very powerful computer but I'm whipped at tic-tac-toe by the Gigatron so let's see here um, page down. Oh, nope, that's it. I keep forgetting the keys to hit. So let's try Tetronus. I have no idea what it is. Bricks fall down. You can rotate them up and move them left to right to fill the field. So I guess I can do that. Each time a horizontal line is filled, it is removed and I will be awarded points. I'm sure getting a lot of reflection from that light in my room. Anyway, I can't get the drift of it here. So that was that. Let's do bricks. Prevent the ball from falling out of the bottom of the scan by moving the bat left and right to bounce it back up. Blocks disappear when hit earning points. Okay. Ah! Slow-witted Paul.
Game over. I lost already. Anyway, so that's the majority of what can be accomplished now with the improved Gigatron. Same computers before, but with a very inexpensive PS2 keyboard adapter and an upgraded ROM. So to the naysayers who originally said this thing is totally useless, and just a demonstrator, I think this uh, has proven them pretty much wrong. It's much cooler now than it was before. Hats off to the guys who invented the Gigatron. I don't think I mentioned it before in the Gigatron video. Um, maybe it's stuck in there somewhere. But uh, just in case I didn't, the uh, blinking lights on the Gigatron that harks back to this old um, mainframe computer days uh, sign that used to be posted and with several variations but this is sort of a composite of them and it certainly reminds me of the ones I used to see in my early days with uh, computers and I'm going to do my best fake German accent Achtung! Alles Touristen und non-technischen Luckenpeepers Das Computer Machine ist nicht für Gefingerpoken und Mittengraben Otherwise, it's easy schnappen their springen work, blowing fusen and poppin corkin mit spitzen sparkin. Ich nicht für gewirken bei das dummkopfen. Das rubbernacker sightseeren must keepen das cotton pickin hander in das pockets. So relaxin and watchin their blinkin lights. There is a bit of an Easter egg buried in the V3 ROM for the Gigatron. And, uh,. Probably shouldn't say how it's arrived at, take all the fun out of it. But uh, I just triggered it there. Brings back a vintage computer game uh, icon, if you will. As far as I can tell, this is all it does. Anyway, just so you know it's there. And my understanding is that different people who received the V3 ROM may have a different Easter egg than the one I showed there, so I'll leave it at that.